Hey everybody, welcome to Awkward Teenage Years. I'm Grant Bowen, I'm your host tonight. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. We hope everyone is at home, staying safe, watching their hands and everything. Uh, just one second here, I've got a little bit of a sound issue. There we go. Apologize for that, live streaming everybody. But anyway, we hope you are staying at home, washing your hands, and if your state is reopening, I still hope you're staying at home and washing your hands. Uh, but thank you for joining us. We are a storytelling show. All the amazing storytellers you're seeing tonight are gonna to be sharing stories from their middle school and high school years. Um, these are stories about like embarrassment, dating, fist fights, mind games, frustrating parents, and ultimately coming of age. So if you guys are ready, Let's get this started. Our first storyteller tonight, uh, she's been stuck inside her house since January with a broken foot. And uh, her documentary, The Fabulist, was accepted into half a dozen film festivals, which were then canceled. But she's also the co-host of Taboo Tales and Mistakes Were Made. So give it up for our first storyteller of the night, Sandy Marks. Sandy? Hey! Oh gosh, I'm gonna take off my picture because I'm so ugly. Here, hold on. Okay, whoops, all right, hide self view. Hi everybody, I, I know you're confused, you're seeing me and you're thinking this snack, this gorgeous sexy beast is awkward ever, was she? Yeah, I was very, very awkward. When I was in middle school, I mean actually, I mean since I can remember, I was such a hot mess. I, I always thought nothing good was gonna happen and obviously it took a while for anything to sort of percolate. Um, but when I was in middle school, I think it was kind of great that I had absolutely no clue as to how losery I really was because um, I didn't really know that there were cool kids in my middle school. I mean, I was too busy focusing on eating my egg salad sandwich at lunch to think that maybe I should be with cooler girls. I just wasn't. And it wasn't until I got to high school where I started to figure out that this was kind of a tragedy in the making. I mean, I had this hair then, now it's worse. Um, I had an overbite. I had a lazy eye. I mean, who needs a lazy eye? There's problems everywhere. And I guess I just never really blossomed. So I hung out with the other kids that were kind of like me and we were all just so kind of off. You know, we were in Glee Club and we put on plays. So we had a lot of jazz hands happening. And I mean, there's nothing worse than seeing geeky kids with jazz hands when you're in your gym. So things did not, they were not progressing. Um, and I started to realize in high school that there were two kinds of girls. There were the nice girls, girls like me, losers. And then there were the bad girls who we called the hitter chicks because they were supposedly from like the wrong side of the tracks. But the truth is all the tracks were bad. I was poor, they were poor, we were all poor. But they had this kind of badassery that I didn't have. Like they had tits, that was like a really good thing. And they had incredible makeup skills. So they always had on like white lipstick and they knew how to draw like eyeliner. You know, when you're 15 and you see that, you think these girls have got it going on. And they really like, they had ankle bracelets while we were a mess. And our big, like if we were gonna get in trouble, it was losing our retainer. I mean, that was like the worst of it. We were such good girls. We were the ones raising our hand, reminding the teacher she hadn't given us homework on a Friday. I mean, who would want that? Who would like this? Nobody. They, on the other hand, like while I'm going rogue losing my retainer, they're going rogue is like stealing from the local five and dime or hanging out and giving blowjobs behind the pizza den. I mean, these girls I wanted desperately to be. My favorite of all these girls was Patty Migliacci. She was so hot and sexy. And I would only see her during assembly, which was once a week on Fridays. And we would go to assembly and he had to wear a uniform, which was a white shirt and a black skirt. And I used to think like Mr. Grossman thinks that the Philharmonic's gonna call, they need someone to fill in the second like violin. We were dressed like we were in a concert. It was ridiculous. We were just sitting in an audience at this ridiculous assembly. But Patty, because she was so hot, she would wear a bright colored bra underneath her white shirt. And then she would like tie it up in a knot 
like Marianne on Gilligan's Island. I mean, you can't get sexier than that. And I so wanted to be here. There was no way it was going to ever happen. But one day, I don't know how this happened, but I got extremely lucky. I was in assembly and I passed Patty Migliacci and I accidentally hit her with my arm. And when I did, she looked at me. She really saw me and she got up really close and she just said, you're dead after school. And I couldn't have been happier. I finally made contact. This woman was in my life. All right, she might want to kill me, but at least she knows who I am. I mean, so this was sort of how pathetic things went. So all through high school, I was the nice girl. All my friends were nice. Our guy friends were nice. I mean, I remember once we had this like sleepover day where we had to write on a piece of paper all of our best attributes, like what makes us attractive in a physical way. And we all tore up pieces of paper, we put it in a hat. And people were saying like, Franka Rothman has a great ass and Angela has great boobs. And for me, they said I had a nice complexion, which just meant that I hadn't like started getting acne yet, which is not something you're like striving for. But you know, that's what it was. So um, by the time I was a junior, turning into a senior in high school, I started getting set up on dates. And um, guys would say to their friends, you should go out with her. And when they say, well, what is she like? They'd say she's nice and she has a good personality. We all know what that's code for. I was the one with the good personality. Oh, and they used to say, and your mother will really like her. Like who wants to be liked by somebody's mother? So I started going out with guys that were equally nice. And they had names like, you know, um, Howard. I mean, where I, when, where I, how I grew up, I'm so old, all the girls were either Karen or Susan and the guys were Howard or Larry. And this is what happened when I met Larry. I met a Larry who was kind of cute, super nice, which means kind of boring. And the first time I met him was at the Forest Hills Jewish Center because while Patty Migliacci and her friends were like getting stoned in some parking lot, we were hanging out in front of a Jewish center drinking like Boone's Farm apple wine or whatever fucking wine we had back then. So Larry and I met and he wanted to take me out and I said, sure, but I had this fallback position because I was so nice. And I know I was nice because I was such a loser. I thought I better be nice to people because that's the only thing I have going for me. So we would start dating. And what I normally do when I went out with guys, I'd go out with them for like two or three months and then I would get bored or they'd get bored or I wouldn't sleep with them. So they felt like, what's the point? And they would dump me and it was like, yes, I don't have to ever be mean to anybody. But Larry, the fucking asshole would not break up with me. He just kept wanting to go out month after month after month until finally I thought, okay, I'm going to have to break up with him. I'm going to have to do something. I didn't want to, but I'm going to have to. So he invites me to an Islanders hockey game. I don't like hockey. I don't know the Islanders, but I'm thinking, okay, it'll be noisy. We'll sit there. I'll break up with him. He won't even hear it. It'll be fine. So he picks me up. Now at this point, I'm, I think I'm about 19 years old. I was just out of high school. So he picks me up. We'd only been going out a few months. We go all the way out there and I'm nervous because I know I'm going to break up with him. This is not going to be going well. We get to the stadium. The game's playing. The Islanders are doing great. They seem to be winning. It's like all a win-win. And I'm like, great, he'll be in a good mood. I'll break up with him. He won't even notice. And it's so noisy. Maybe he won't hear it. So finally, the game is ending. And it's one of those games, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been to hockey, but the audience, I call them an audience because I'm so theatrical, the fans are so rowdy that I once went to a game where I saw a fan lift a chair and throw it. They were bolted down these chairs. I don't know how he got it up, but somehow he got up a chair and he threw the thing. So this was a perfect place to break up with somebody. Who's gonna hear anything? So the game is almost over, we're winning. And I turn to Larry, it's almost over. And now meanwhile, Larry is a really good guy. His parents are in the light fixture business. They're in electronics and they're very, very wealthy, which is probably why I went out with them longer than I should have. They make all the switch covers with like this little belt and it says Levitan. So if I had wound up with him, I would have been up to my tits and dimmer switches. I mean, it would have been like an amazing thing, even though I didn't like him and I was way too young to settle down. So just as I turn to him and I'm telling him, Larry, I gotta talk to you. He says, Sandy, I gotta tell you something. And I'm thinking, oh, this is so good. He's gonna break up with me. I can continue just being a nice girl. And he goes, Sandy, we need to talk. I have to ask you a very important question. And then he goes into his members only jacket and he pulls out a jewelry box, a velvet jewelry box. 
and my head is spinning. I'm thinking, what could this be? Why is he doing this? This is not a breakup thing. And he opens it up and there is a huge engagement ring. I am still a child. Why would I be getting married? Where does he come from? His parents are not Hasidic. I do not understand what's happening. He opens it up and he says, Sandy, you know, we've only been going out a few months, but I know this is real. Will you marry me? And I don't know what to do. So I, I'm polite. So I say, no, thank you. I don't know what else to say. And he looks like he's going to start to cry. He's so shocked. He can't believe that I'm not excited about this huge, I mean, huge engagement. So I say, no, I can't get married. I'm way too young. I'm not getting married. So he says, okay, well, you got to do me one last favor. And I'm like, anything, because I'm thinking I just did the worst possible thing. I led this guy on, obviously. He said, my parents are throwing us a surprise engagement party in Great Neck. And you have to come back to my house and pretend we are getting married just for tonight. And I just look at him and I think, okay, I already fucked around here and I've already made you upset. I'll do it. So I put the engagement ring on, which was so heavy. It was like giving me scoliosis. I put the ring on. We get in his car. We drive all the way out to Long Island. We get to the house. They open the door and it is so brightly lit. They're in the lighting business. There are sconces and chandeliers and switches everywhere. I'm like blinded by, they have the, the furniture covered in plastic. I mean, it's truly a palace. It's a real lighting palace. And I walk in and I meet the mom and she smells like Shalimar and she's wearing a lot of lipstick and the dad, he's smoking. And I meet all the relatives and they're all asking me, where do you want to go on your honeymoon? And when are you going to get married? And all I'm thinking about is, wait, I haven't even started college yet. What are you talking about? So I pretend and I put on the greatest show and I say, well, we want to go to Hawaii and let's get married somewhere on Long Island. And I go on and on and on for hours. I'm doing this. I'm dying. I'm absolutely dying. And they've got the spread from Ben's Deli in the kitchen. And it's just, it's a nightmare. It's a shit show. Finally, I pull on, I tug on Larry and I go, okay, you got to, this is it. We're over. I got to go home. She goes, fine. Thank you. You did what you're supposed to do. So we load back in the car. I say goodbye to everybody. See you soon. We load back in the car. We drive back to Queens to my parents' apartment. It's very quiet. I very, very painfully take off this probably $30,000 engagement ring, which would have paid for my college education back in the eighties. So I give him back the ring. He takes it back. All I could think about when I walk back in the house is, you know what? There's a huge difference between being nice and being kind. Now, if you're kind, which I learned then as a young adult, you tell the truth, you let people down, and you be honest. You just say it's not going to work out. But if you're nice, you can wind up like me on Long Island in a very well-lit house, staring down a platter of sweaty meats, trying to pretend that you are something you will never be. That's my story. Gosh. <laughs> wow. Amazing. wow. That is the worst kind of hostage situation I've ever heard. You have to come to this party hostage. with me and tell people we're engaged. Who's doing that? God. With like streamers and balloons and oh. Also, the, the sentence, he reached into his members only jacket. <laughs> Not as romantic as you would think it is. <laughs> Interesting. Oh man, thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, do you have anything you want to plug? Where can people find you? Uh, well, I'm on Instagram, Sandy Marks. Um, my movie hopefully will be streaming soon. Um, and I do a lot of storytelling shows and come out and see us at Taboo Tales. Hopefully we'll be back at the pit soon. But whatever, um, and uh, yeah, I'm around. I'm uh, starring in my own world in Brooklyn in my apartment right now. Gotcha. <laughs> We're all in the same boat. Thank you so much, Sandy. Great job. All right. Our next storyteller. Um, we're very excited to have him on board. He's one of the regular hosts at The Moth. Uh, give a warm round of applause to Andrew McGill. Andrew, you're up. Unmute. Hey, 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 what's up, y'all? Uh, how you doing? Uh, so this picture behind me is what I used to look like uh, when I was 13. Nothing's really changed. If you kind of look at me now, it's like, if you watch Pokemon, this is like the, the Charmander. Now I'm like the Charizard. I got a little beard. My glasses have kind of fit my face a little more. But what's, what's crazy about this picture is 
So um, if you're at, like, I guess everyone's at home, so everyone's online or doing dating stuff or whatever. But um, I used to just be a homebody, like this Corona times of me just staying, people just staying at home, you know, watching TV, uh, uh, playing video games. I would do that all the time. Um, cause I just couldn't go out. I was 13 years old. You know, my Haitian American parents, my mom's like, you're not going outside. You want to, what do you want? Did you join a gang? Nah, you're going to stay home and just, just read books, read the dictionary. And, uh, so we had a computer and, um, you know, she'd be like, yeah, you just be doing your homework on there. Right. I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm doing homework. That's a lot. Uh, it's a lot. I got into, uh, AOL chat rooms and AOL chat rooms are, fun they're so fun when you're a little kid because you're not talking a asl or age age sex location you're like yo where you at where you from and you know you're making friends you're like yo i got a friend in in canada you know i got homies like all all around the all around the world and i used to go in these chat rooms or whatever like hang out da, 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 talk to people and i remember i don't know how i got to this site but it's called teen spot this site doesn't exist anymore it's gone off the map but um so basically teen spot is kind of like it's like Facebook. Um, not really like Facebook. It's, I mean, it's, I guess kind of like Facebook, but it's like, you can you make your profile and then you like go in a chat room, you talk to people, but it's only teens, um, which is a terrible idea. This is an awful idea. Um, and this photo, so I took a photo of myself and I, you know, put it on my profile and i remember no one friended me and i was uh, like you know going to chat rooms talk to people hey what's up how you doing da, da, da. and like i wasn't getting the right response uh, and i would look at all these other teen spot profiles and it's like you know these like scrawny white skater dudes or you know guys with hair like this <laughs> and i'm like you know what i was like all right man you know what maybe this photo won't work and this is look at this look at this kid this kid looks crazy. Of course, this kid would have an idea of like, you know what, I'm going to find a random photo. Like, I'm going to find someone else's photo and put it on my thing. And you think I'd find like a black guy's photo, right? Or a black kid's photo, right? Nah, <laughs> I picked the scrawniest, whitest, skaterest dude. Um, I changed <laughs> the name from whatever Andrew McGill was like, Stan, whatever. It was, <laughs> from Andrew to Stan, it's pretty linear, not even a lot. And, um, boy, I was out here. The, the, the amount of uh, friend requests, it was amazing. It was awesome. You know, people hit me up, yo, blah, blah. And, and it, the lies just kind of, <laughs> the lies just kind of came, man. People were like, yo, where are you from? I'd be like, I'm from California. <laughs> I was like, what? And I'm like, what do you do? I'm like, yeah, I'm a, I'm a skater. I love skating. And I, <laughs> I remember I found a picture of some guy doing a kickflip it didn't even look like the first guy in the photo but i found a picture of a guy doing a kickflip and i put it as the second photo and i would just find just random photos of just the back of like just white people doing cool stuff but just from the back or from the side where it didn't really show their face i'm like yeah you know i went skiing with the family i was doing this doing that and man I know they say catfishing is like a terrible thing, but it's so fun. Oh my gosh. And I didn't even see it as catfishing. I was just like, you know, I'm just out here hanging. And I remember uh, I got like a, you know, message from this girl and she was fine. Like she's, she's, she's very cute. Um, and she's like, Hey, what's up? Like I'm from, da -da -da, I'm from New York city. And she was like talking and she's like, yo, I think you're really cool. And like, we're starting talking to each other, but like, I'm not the, the guy, you know, I'm, I'm Stan. So I'm like talking about, yeah, you know, I'm from California, but like my family comes to New York city. I'm like, what the fuck am I saying? Like what? And you know, when you're in too deep, you kind of just have to go, you just gotta, you just gotta go with it. Like, I'm not going to be like, yeah, I'm, I'm lying. I was like, nah, nah, nah. you just gotta fully commit to this guy. So whatever, I'm talking to this girl and the way that, I don't know, the internet, not even the way that the internet, the way that teen spot was, is you'd be like, yo, I'm, dating this like you'd be talking to this person for like two hours and you're like yeah we're dating like we're we're official we made it online official and like you know talking to them like i know this girl like i really got to know her and like i think i had like a flip phone and i remember she was like yo do you want to like text and i was like yo i would love to text so now i'm like texting this girl and i'm going in deep and like she's like yo can we call each other and this is like this is like for a week and like we start talking on the phone calling each other she's like yo i love you and I'm like yo what is up 
and she's like, yo, I really want to, <laughs> she's like, yo, I really want to see you, and I really want to be with you, and I'm like, me too, girl, <laughs> I'm like, I can't wait to see you, and, you know, back in, I don't know what I was thinking in my head, I was, I, I, I probably watched too much Disney movie or romantic comedies, and I was like, man, it'll all work out, you know, it'll, I'll, I'll figure it out, <laughs> it'll, 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 um, it'll work itself out. And, you know, at, at one point I was just like, Hey, I, I would like, I think I'm, I, I told her I'm coming to New York city. We should definitely like meet up. And it's like crazy. What the fuck? Like I'm, I should have, I should have died. Whatever. And I'm like, yeah, we should definitely meet up. Like, let's hang out. <laughs> and, and then she was like, Hey, I actually have something to tell you. And I was like, what? And she's like, I'm not the person who I am in my picture and I was like yo I was like how dare you <laughs> how dare you lie to me and she's like you know what like I, this is who I am and she showed me the <laughs> and it's this makes me seem terrible but whatever she showed me the picture of who she was and I was like wow really you broke my trust <laughs> because I can't what I'm supposed to do say oh yeah I'm, I'm a liar too I, I'm, I'm also a catfisher and uh, I didn't. I uh, was like, I was like, wow, you really, you really broke my heart. And I was like, you really, I can't trust you anymore. And I like let her go. And when stuff like, I guess, when something like that happens, it's like, oh man, I guess I was kind of just like, I guess fate wants me to keep catfishing. I guess like if I'm not gonna get really caught, like, I guess I could just live it up. So then I go on this like, man, like like six months of just like not I, uh now when i look at it, i'm like oh it's kind of bad but just like online dating like just and it was like teen spot dating like i had this girl and this girl blah, blah, blah. i had rachel rachel on tuesdays then i had this other girl blah, 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 blah. and then i meet this girl from the uk and she's mad cool really dope you know we're and it's kind of the same thing like you know talking blah, 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 email, email like and we didn't we were in a call because you and we're not she's from the uk and she tells me like hey i'm actually coming to new york city you know i changed up yeah i'll be in, i'm in new york you know i'm bi-coastal new york california it's a lie i can make whatever and she said i'm hey i'm gonna be in new york city i uh, would love to meet up and i'm kind of thinking about and I, i'm you know i've, I've, I've catfished so much where i'm just like yeah whatever you know i might I might link up and she she says hey let's let's actually meet up and I remember, I was like, you know what? I'm not gonna tell her, I'm just gonna go to the spot. And remember, I look like this, but I, man, I wish I had the photo of the, the stand guy that I, ah, damn it, I'll, 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 if, if you guys wanna DM me later, I'll show you the picture of what Stan looked like. I don't have it on the phone. But um, I remember she's like, yo, let's meet up. And I remember we met um, around Washington Square. And this was like, I'm 15 years old. So I go into the city um, and, I, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, she was expecting a tall, white dude, name Stan. And I like, she's sitting there. I'm like, hey, how you doing? And she's like, hey, what's up? And I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm Stan. I'm like, actually, no, I'm not. And I'm, I, I'm like, I actually am this guy. Da, 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 da. And it is as horrible as you think that an altercation would happen. It was just like, what the fuck? Like, that's so weird. Why would you do that? And it's like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I got in too deep. And um, I wish there was a happy, no, there's a, there is a happy ending. It's like, there, there's, a, <laughs> it's like, I wish there, I had to kill her. No, no, no. Um, there is, a <laughs> she knew, she knew too much. No, no, no. Um, I guess there's, I mean, she's now like a famous blogger uh and she like works for like the uk vogue you know? but and she probably remembers this and it is one it is probably talking about it it's one of the most awkward things ever because i'm like damn like i really was deep in the internet deep into catfishing and now when i like i guess when i watch the catfish show i'm like yeah yeah you guys you know, catfish, but y'all didn't really like catfish. Like I committed to a cause. Um, and I didn't even know what I expected. I don't know if I expected us to get together and her to forget all the trauma that, I, and it's just lies. Cause she'd be like, don't you like, can't you juggle? I'm like, I don't know how to juggle. Those are all lies I made up. 
and man uh so yeah it was awkward um i think that's as about as awkward you can you can get for like a teenager but you know I was I was coming from you know Yu-Gi-Oh addiction and all this other crazy shit, but uh, it was uh, it, I mean it's better now. I don't I don't catfish people anymore because I uh, you know it's too much work. <laughs> Catfishing now is just too much is too much work. Uh, I wish I could get back into it, but it's just I'm not lo- young like I used to. It's, <laughs> I had so much time to catfish. I don't got time for lies anymore. I just I have to tell you the truth. I'll, I'll tell you the truth, but. I don't catfish anymore and she'll probably never see this, <laughs> but I, I hope you know that I'm sorry um, because I was an awkward uh, teenager. Look at me, look, come on, look at this face. Of course this kid was catfish. Look at him, <laughs> the, the flashes in his eyes. He's not even smiling. Look at this photo. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> it seems sad, but it is, uh, it's, a, it's a happy ending because I'm, you know, not a catfisher anymore i guess is that be yeah it is um but yeah i was an awkward ass teenager and now i'm a regular semi-normal adult i guess and that is uh, <laughs> that's my tale <laughs> wow thank you thank you thank you thank you great job andrew if that is your real name <laughs> see every time i always say that everyone's like oh is that your real i'm like nah it really is but you know sometimes I love, I love that your reformation isn't through any kind of like moral recognition of what you did. It's just like, oh, it's too hard. It's too much work now. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. It's it's too much. It's too much. Also, I, so much I love that you contextualize aging through Pokemon references. I really appreciate that. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Charizard now. That's great. <laughs> you see this beard? You see this beard? Oh, yeah. This kid, honestly, this is a terrifying photo. And uh, it's you, you were, I mean, you knew you were up to something. It's the- I, if I, I thought, like, if, if you know how people think about catfish, oh, that's crazy. But imagine what I was thinking. I thought I was insane. I was like, yo, what am I doing? Why do I keep lying to these people? But then I'm like, too easy. It's, it's too damn easy, bro. It's too damn easy. Oh, you definitely refined it to an art form. <laughs> so, Andrew, where do you have anything you would like to plug while you're here? Uh, yeah, you can just find me on uh, Instagram, uh, Hood Jeff Drew. Um, and if you see me running through Prospect Park, um, say nothing to me. Stand seven feet away from me and uh, <laughs> just mind your business. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, just wave and say hi. Uh, but yeah, that's all. Ah, perfect. Thank you, Andrew. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. We're going to keep the show going. Our next storyteller uh, is based in Queens. Uh, She's been seen at several Moth community events and story slams. And she's one of the co-creators of this very show. And she's the queen of intro. So I'm gonna try to see if I can bring the same energy here. Introducing Anastasia Maximenko! Thank you very much for this intro. My, don't take my style, okay? Um, thank you for this intro again. Okay, so when I was 13 years old, my parents decided to get divorced. And I wasn't that kid that was like crying for attention or being overly dramatic, like, what about me? Don't get divorced, please. Because I, like at 13, I knew that Getting divorced is the best thing that can happen to my parents. So, like, starting from my mom, like, my mom loved my dad unconditionally. And when he had one affair after another, she would still take him back. So I knew that is not healthy, that is not healthy for her self-esteem and, like, just not healthy mentally. And... Even though she loved my dad, I believe that she deserves better. She deserved men who who love her back and who would respect her. And my father, on another side, he's alcoholic. But again, at 13, I knew that he's alcoholic for a reason. Maybe because of his difficult childhood, maybe because he was a failed musician, or maybe because he was working so much on the... Um, iron plant um, 
working many, many hours and still being living in the poverty. So, and I knew that like my dad would need like some very strong person behind him so that the strong person can pull him out of this alcoholic hole. But it's not my mom. My mom is kind and nice, but she's not that strong. So I, you know, divorce it is. It's a good thing. And also because um, this new affair, this other woman that my dad had at that time, she forced him to, you know, to get a divorce. And I, again, I didn't mind because I thought this other woman is a pretty nice lady. And when I would uh, visit them at home, because now my dad lived uh, with that other woman, we would have nice conversations and I would play with her five years old son. So all good, divorce, yay. But one day, one very nice sunny day, I'm playing badminton with my best friend, Natasha. And we're laughing and we're having fun because we cannot play longer than six hits. And we're just like having blasts and we're laughing. And then the, my friend Natasha stops and she looks at me and she goes, don't laugh like that. And I'm like, what? And she's like, your face looks weird. Don't laugh like that. And I'm like, what do you mean? What? like oh you need to look at, at the mirror let's go to your house and you know look at the mirror so we went to to my house because we played badminton closer to my home and i'm looking at the mirror and yes like my right eye is like drooping and my like cheek muscles and skin just falling down and like right side of 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 my mouth is just like downside and left side is just like smiling and everything and i'm like i look really weird but again i this didn't freak me out but it did freak out my mom because now when i was sleeping like i would have my right eye a little bit open and i look like i'm possessed so we went to the doctor like the next day and we're in in our small clinic and physician is saying that yes, my right side of my face is paralyzed. But she cannot, like the doctor cannot tell us anything else with the reason why it happened, how to treat it. So we have to go to a bigger city, to a bigger clinic, to see neurologists or and other doctors to get tested. And we went to that uh, bigger clinic and test of their test, and I had to go back and come back again. And after all the tests, we are sitting uh, in the office with the, this neurologist and he, he's saying that there is no actual like medical reason for paralysis, like everything is fine with my hormones and like all the other things, like everything is good. So he's saying that the reason is like psychological, the paralysis that your daughter has is because of the stress stress is anything wrong with the school is anything wrong with her friendships and my mom goes like oh i'm getting divorced with her father so probably can that be a reason and you're all just saying like yes that's definitely a reason for for the paralysis and i'm sitting there i'm thinking like i'm not stressed because of my parents getting divorced i'm not stressed at all and then the wave of emotion is just crashing on me and i'm starting starting to cry like crazy and it, like it's his, hysterical cry because i cannot stop so they had to inject me with the um sedative to you know to calm me down and afterwards you know i got my many many treatments and you know like paralysis went away and now you can see that i can move all the parts of my face so all good but like inability to process my emotion still you know stayed with me until this day but hey i'm working on it thank you
Wow. Thank you, Anastasia. That's, that's a story. Uh, how many, so, so this is, this is the second week you've told a story that involves a doctor's visit. Oh my uh, goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, is this going to be an ongoing uh, series of, of high school? Uh, <laughs> Doctor visits? <laughs> no, oh, that would be all. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, thank you so much. Also, could you demonstrate the, the full range of motion in your face one more time? Here we go. Oh, right. Right. oh that's wild. Oh, good. That's, that's, that's that's good. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Anastasia. Do you have anything uh, you want to plug? Let people know where they can find you. So you can find me on Instagram, Anastasia that speaks. And right now is the moment for public service announcement. Yes, bring on the PSA. If we can have that. So, we just want to mention, um, we just want to mention a few organizations that mean a lot to us. Um, and basically, first uh, organization would be Frigid New York. Uh, this is a theater company in New York, and they organize uh, Frigid festivals every year. And actually, we did our original Awkward Teenage Years show uh, during the Frigid Festival this year, back in February. So without Frigid Festival, without Frigid Theater, the show wouldn't exist. So that is why we want you to find out more about this amazing organization. And uh, you can find them online at www.frigid.com nyc and also at frigid new york on all the social media uh so social media please donate because as any other theater company right now they're going through a really really hard time and you can donate to go to their venmo venmo.com slash frigid new york or become their patron on, on the patreon.com at frigid slash frigid new york me, Grant, and Will, we're actually patrons of Frigid, so become uh, their patron as well. The next organization is Magnet Theater, and um, Magnet Theater is the best theater for the improvisation, and they give, they provide a process in improvisation as well as a storytelling. So we can say that without Magnet Theater, we wouldn't be a storytellers. So please, please, please check them out. Um, and uh, you can also uh, find them on their social media at Magnet uh, Theater. And they actually continue um, producing shows every day. And you can find them also on twitch.com, uh, twitch.tv slash The Magnet Theater and watch their shows for every day of the week. And please donate. Uh, also, they again, as any theater company, they're going through the hard time this, in this situation. And you can go to magnettheater.com and click on the virtual shows banner and find out how you can donate. Thank you for the PSA. Thanks, Anastasia. We appreciate it. And great job again. Um, so we're going to bring up our next storyteller. He is one of the other co-creators of the show. He's a filmmaker and storyteller in Jersey City. Uh, he's been seen at the Moth, the Magnet Theater, and various other virtual online storytelling shows. In fact, uh, this very show was his idea. He forces me to call him Zaddy in our production meetings, and I have asked him to stop. Please welcome Will Clegg. Thanks, Grant. Uh, I just, I think I just asked you nicely to call me Zaddy. I'm not forcing you, just for the record. Uh, all right, so it's, uh, it's the second week of my ninth grade year, my last year of middle school, and rumors are swirling around the school that this kid, Brian, who's in the eighth grade, has been talking shit about me. Now, I don't know Brian at all. I know who he is because we go to the same school, but I've never talked to him before. 
Uh, we don't know each other. And then I asked my friends, like, you know, what is this, uh, this shit that he's been talking? And I can't really get any specifics out of anybody. And I start to suspect that perhaps I'm being set up here because uh, my friend Jeff is very mischievous. And, and he's also loves fights. Like he loves to get into fights, even though he pretty much loses them all. Uh, he loves watching other people fight. And he's been doing a lot of this, like setting people up to fight recently, uh, just to see how they'll, how they'll do in a fight. This is an age, you know, like 13, 14 years old, where uh, if you're not in a physical fist fight with somebody, then how could your friends possibly know what kind of man you're going to become, right? And, uh, and I think that Jeff is, is setting this up. And then in one day, uh, I run into Brian in the hallway. Now, Brian looks exactly like I do. At this time, we both have long hair, like down past our shoulders. We like to wear shirts of our favorite bands like Metallica and Megadeth and wear ripped up jeans. We're both really scrawny. Only thing is, Brian is like a full head shorter than me. And, and he walks right up to me and he's just like, I heard you've been talking shit. I'm like, me? No, you're the one who's been talking shit. That's what everybody's telling me. And he's like, what? Fuck you. I'm like, fuck me, fuck you. And then he runs into me with his shoulder and just passes right by me. And then his friends and my friends are all like, oh, it's on, it's on. Now you got to fight. And I look and I see Jeff and he's got this little smile. And I'm like, you son of a bitch. I knew you're the one setting this thing up. But there's nothing I can do now. The trap has been set and I'm in it. And I know that I got to fight this kid. Because if I don't, if I back down, then I'm going to become like the worst thing that you can become when you're in the ninth grade, which is that all your friends are going to call you a pussy. I don't want that label. I know it's going to last like a generation if I get it. And, and honestly, I've worked really hard to get this group of friends. My first two years in middle school were pretty rough. I got bullied a lot. And then I was just a loser. And I didn't really have any friends. And so finally, like through soccer and other stuff, I've made this group of friends and I don't want to let go of them. And I think that if I don't fight this kid, I'm going to lose my group of friends. So, so they all set up this fight for that coming Friday after school. And, uh, and I'm just very anxious about it. And the day comes and I'm thinking like, how can I get out of this now? Can I, can I fake being sick and go home early? Can I intentionally injure myself in gym class? I, I, you know, I don't come up with any good plans and I don't do anything. I'm just paralyzed by the fear of doing this. And, and finally the bell rings. It's the end of the day. And I'm at my locker. And my friends all come around and they're like, all right, it's time. They're all super excited to see how I'm going to do in this fight. And I'm just terrified. And, and we start walking down to the selected location, uh, which is the playground of the adjacent elementary school. And as soon as we get outside, raindrops start to fall as if this couldn't be any more miserable. And as we're walking over there, like I realize I don't really know what's about to happen. You know, I've never been in a fight. Like I, I rough house with my little brother, but like I was never trying to hurt him, you know, and like how, how does it start? Like, how does it end? Like, is somebody going to give up? Uh, you know, is an adult going to like hopefully come and break it all up? Are we fighting to the death? Like I just, I really have no idea anything that's about to happen. And now it starts pouring. It's like a fucking monsoon. And we get down to the playground, which is why you see this, this rained upon playground behind me. This is not the exact playground, but it looks pretty much like where we were. And, and a big circle forms around me and Brian, made up of his friends and my friends. And we both take our backpacks off. And Brian's like known to be a fighter. Like he's a scrappy kid. He's been in a bunch of fights. And, uh, and I've never been in one that anybody knows about. And I mean, I really haven't actually. And, and so uh, I'm kind of looking to him to make the first move. And, he, and he's kind of stalking around, giving me the evil eye. And then he just walks up to me and he, and he puts his fists up and instinctively I just, I swing at him and, and I connect, I hit him really hard, like right here in the cheek. And it's this awful sound. Uh, it's like in the, in the Rocky movies, you know, when he's training in the meat locker and he's just pounding the sides of beef. Like it sounds like that. It's just disgusting. And I hit him hard and he staggers back and he looks up and he's holding his face and he's like, wow, you know, nice hit. I don't know why this little phrase sets me off but I just see red and like all the rage and anger that I've had built up inside of me from the last couple of years of being bullied and feeling like a loser it all just comes pouring out now and Brian rushes back to me and he takes a swing at me but he's too short 
uh, and, and he misses. And I realized that, you know, pretty quickly, like I can still hit him and he can't hit me. And so I swing again, I hit him again in the exact same place in the face. And in this time it like feels kind of good. And then he swings again and he misses. And I hit him again. And this just happens over and over again, like 12, 13, 14 times. So finally he falls back and he takes a knee and he says, that's enough, enough. And then like nothing happens. Nobody picks up my arm. Nobody cheers. Uh, it just, it feels awful for everybody because they all just watch me like beat the shit out of this kid and, and nobody feels good about it now. And so the crowd just kind of like slowly dissipates and we all walk off into our own little like sad afternoon. And, uh, and I've missed the bus because it's so late. So I have to walk home by myself in the pouring rain. The next Monday, I get back to school. And first thing I get called in the principal's office. I know this is coming. I know why I'm going down there. And the principal is a, is a friend of my parents. And so this is like doubly bad. And I get down there and I can see it in her face already. She's so mad. And she sits me down. She says, look, I know everything. Okay, I know about the fight. Don't even try and deny it. I'm so disappointed in you. And now I, I was a kid who was like, on the honor roll, you know, I was on the student council. Like I was mostly a pretty good kid. So this is, I've never been called to the principal's office before. And, and she says, look, I can't do anything about it officially because you weren't on our school property. It was after school hours, but I want you to know that I'm just so disappointed. I'm calling your mom and I'm telling her what happened. This is like probably the worst thing she could do actually. And, and I slink out of the office, just feeling awful and sad. And I look over and I see Brian sitting there waiting to go into the office next. And he's just got this gigantic welt on his face because it's just one spot where he just kept hitting him. And he looks sad and ashamed too. And we just share this moment. We're just feeling so stupid. And I go home that afternoon and I get a long talking to from my parents about fighting and why it's so bad. And, and I know why it's so bad, you know, but I just, I can't bring myself to tell them that I only did it because I was afraid of losing my friends. So I just accept their punishment, which is being grounded for a month because I know that I deserve it. But I also decide right then and there that I'm never going to get into another fist fight again. And I'm proud to say that I never have. Thanks. So Grant, you're muted, buddy. It would help if it would help if my microphone was on. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Uh, great job. Uh, doesn't the rain and and the mud just make a fight more epic? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It just does it more sad. <laughs> you're like you're fighting like Spartans out there, and I love that. Uh, I love that a compliment triggered you. It was just like <laughs> a nice hit. I think it was just like it was so. Uh, so unexpected that he would say that like I didn't know what was gonna happen in the fight but I definitely didn't expect him to like like speak to me at like a human level <laughs> in any way you know uh and I don't know it just yeah it just threw me for a loop so Will you're a great person <laughs> Will, I like you so much <laughs> that's a nice shirt today <laughs> not my proudest moment no <laughs> Real fights are never as cool as they look in the movies. But uh, anyway, Will, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Where can people find you? Yeah, a couple of things. Um, well, first, you can find me on Instagram. It's uh, the underscore WZA. Uh, you can find me on Facebook, just Will Clegg. Um, also, I want to talk a little bit about this upcoming festival that's uh, it's going to be in June. It's a 24-hour storytelling festival that some folks from Toronto are putting on. And uh, I just, it's a really cool idea. If you go to my Instagram and my stories, I posted about it. If you're a storyteller watching this, uh, their submissions are due tomorrow, actually, for this, if you want to get involved. And, uh, and the theme for the show is called uh, When the Impossible Becomes Possible. So it's meant to be like an uplifting, you know, sort of uh, show. And there's going to be people from all over the world doing it. So I just think it's a really neat idea. And uh, you should go check that out. Um, it's put on by Replay Storytelling out of Toronto. And now I'm going to show you guys a graphic of, uh, let's see here. Yes, I believe you have some, uh, some news for Awkward Teenage Years. Here we go, Awkward Teenage Years, yes. So you can find Awkward Teenage Years, this show, on Facebook and Instagram at Awkward Teenage Years. If you want to be on this show, you can email us your pitch at awkwardteenageyears at gmail.com. 
Uh, it doesn't matter if you've told stories before or not. If you've never told a story before, that's fine. If you got something great from your teenage years, just send us an email and we'll be happy to work with you if you want to develop your story. And uh, some news that Grant mentioned is we just put all of our past streaming shows up on YouTube. So if you search for Awkward Teenage Years, you will find the shows. If you subscribe and follow us on there, you will help us to eventually be able to have our own URL. Uh, we're not able to do that until we have 100 followers, so please help us out there. And also, please follow us here on Twitch. If you're not already, uh, that helps us out as well. So um, we're glad you're enjoying the shows and uh, hope you'll keep coming back. All right. Thank you, Will. Yes, follow us. Give us a follow here on Twitch if you're watching now and subscribe to our channel over on YouTube, and that's really going to help us out a lot. Thank you, guys. All right. We're down to our final storyteller of the night. Really excited. Uh, he's a writer, storyteller, and improviser. You can see him perform with his improv team, Sexy Baby. That is Sexy Baby. And you can read his blog over at www.actuallyitsrobpenty.org.com. Please welcome Rob Penty. Thanks, Grant. That was a really good way to, to do my, my <laughs> I like that. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, cool, guys. Um, so I'm going to talk uh, about a senior prom because uh, nothing sums up my high school life, my high school love life, or lack thereof, uh, like my senior prom. So it was my senior year, and I had just gotten home from soccer practice, and my father said, that my mother was on the phone with my prom date. And this was very bad news. Now, my prom date wasn't my girlfriend because I didn't have a girlfriend in high school. And there are many reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is that I was a very late bloomer. Uh, the stereotype of high school boys, I think in the popular media is that they're all desperate to have sex and hook up. But that's a little different uh, when you're the kind of person who gets his driver's license before pubes. And uh, the second reason is Catholicism, which basically made me ashamed of any and all thoughts of any kind of even heterosexual romance. And the third uh, was the very special episode. Now, for those of you who were uh, not born in the mid to late 70s, the very special episode was an episode of a sitcom that tackled an important issue. Um, and when the very special episode was about sex, there were two plots. The first was a couple who uh, were deciding whether or not to have sex, and they always didn't, much like the episode of Different Strokes, where uh, uh, Willis and Janet Jackson uh, decided not to go into the fast lane. Uh, and the second, where some jerk guy is trying to pressure a girl into sex, um, or uh, some guy is trying to go out with like a sure thing, much like the episode of Mr. Belvedere, where the older brother um, goes out with this woman just to have sex with her and at the very end decides not to because uh, he decides he's not gonna become a man that night. And after watching those with no real experience with women, those were my teachers and I thought to myself, yeah, I'll never be that kind of guy who pressures women into sex. And it just turned into, I'll never have sex. <laughs> and, um, and, the, the, the thing about those shows is they never showed a positive experience of a couple having, you know, safe sex that was like an expression of love or something like that. It was always this horrible thing to be avoided. And if all of those like mental obstacles weren't enough, when I was in middle school, um, around the time that, you know, crushes started happening and I was going to like bar and bat mitzvahs and like slow dancing with girls and girls were noticing me and I was noticing them, my father ruined everything by deciding to send me to an all boys Jesuit high school. And it was like, we had this great local public school that was, uh, was really good. And I, there was like no reason for him to do this. I was like, why do you want me to go? And he said, because I like how the Jesuits think. And he wasn't even Catholic. My mother was Catholic and she didn't want me to go to Catholic school because she had been. And I was like, you don't even know how these people think. You're not a Catholic. It's all just guilt and shame. But that's it. Um, so I didn't go to my junior prom because, um, again, like I didn't have a girlfriend uh, and I didn't have anyone to ask. And uh, but I knew that I had to go to my senior prom. I just had to because it's a cultural milestone. Like we all 
go to prom. We have like our prom photos. Everybody has their prom photo. Like I can't not do this. But again, culturally, the prom means sex. Um, 90210, Brenda and Dylan had sex. Uh, the classic film American Pie featured four gentlemen uh, all losing their virginities in one night. Um, but I knew that wasn't gonna be my prom. So let me tell you about my senior prom. So senior year was actually pretty good. I um, put a lot of pressure on myself to get good grades, to get into college. And second semester senior year, I was in college and things were good and you know, I was hanging out with friends. And I remember one night I went to uh, this thing, this tradition in our town called senior bowling um, that the kids in the public school did. Um, and I was still friends with all of them. So I was there hanging out with my friends that night. And one night I was talking with my friend Risa and she said to me, you know what, Rob, you're kind of hot. And this needs to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, she wasn't actually saying like, I think you're hot. I think she was just like saying like, you know, you look good these days. It was, and it was just sort of her trying to like boost my self esteem. I mean, she knew that I didn't have a girlfriend or anything like that. And she said to me like, hey, do you have a date to your prom? And I didn't. And she said, I want to go to your prom with you. Now, a couple of things. First, uh, Risa was actually the long-term girlfriend of my best friend, Josh. Uh, so she wasn't really offering to like go out with me. She had like her real prom at her school that she would go to and that would be like a real prom for her. Um, but also, we would uh, go to the same college the next year. And I know now that she was about eight months away from coming out of the closet. So at the time, um, and in retrospect, I knew that there was no chance or prospect of me having sex at all. And it was totally fine. Um, and I was fine with that. Because again, late bloomer, Catholicism, very special episode, all that stuff. And she was my friend. And she's very pretty. She'd be a lovely date. And I was really looking forward to it and we'd have a good time, you know? So it's all good. So, but then a couple of weeks later, I was coming home from soccer practice and my dad tells me, your mother was just on the phone with Risa. Now, she had called to, uh, to tell me something. Um, and the thing about calling my mother is uh, don't do it because she just, my mother was this, basically this actress without a stage. Um, she was a very dramatic person. And anybody who ever called my mother got roped into an hours long conversation. And you know, it was pretty, like 95, five, you know what I mean? Just like mom, just yapping. Friends, parents of friends, acquaintances, like I, I, probably time life operators, I don't even know. But anybody who called my mother just got, roped into a very, very long conversation. And Risa called and my mother answered and I wasn't there to protect her. And here's what I missed. Risa had called to tell me that she actually couldn't go to the prom with me anymore because she had a softball playoff game that night. So my mother gave her a talking to. And at one point the phrase, and let me tell you something was used. And do you know, do you remember that um, leaked voicemail that Ireland Baldwin had of Alec Baldwin um, calling her a little pig? I remember listening to that and in that, in that um, message, he actually uses that phrase. And when I heard it, he goes, and let me tell you something. And I was like, oh, oh. I, like, I sort of like shuddered a little bit because I've had that said to me by my mother many times. And let me tell you something, okay? So, and I don't know if that's just like an Irish Catholic guilt thing that, we all know. So my mother said to Risa, let me tell you something, Risa. My son would never do this to you. And I said to my father, he actually said that to her? And he goes, yeah. So suffice it to say, by the end of that conversation, I still had a prom date and Risa had agreed to skip her softball playoff game. <laughs> um, it was a good time. We had fun and we went to my friend's like guest house the night and it was, I was still such a good little boy. I didn't drink or do anything, but it was like nice to hang out. And she's a good friend. She still is. And it was really, really fun. But I just want to let you know that on prom night, culturally, one of the most romantic nights in a young person's life, I went with my best friend's girlfriend who was less than a year from coming out of the closet 
and she wanted to back out of it, but my mother wouldn't let her. So that was my senior prom. And uh, for those of you keeping score, I'm 43 years old and I've never been married. But I think that's probably a coincidence. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> <laughs> bravo, bravo. Uh, amazing. <laughs> amazing, I can't. I, you're, I'm sure your mother's a sweet woman, but I can't imagine anything more mortifying as a teenager. <laughs> I mean, it was mortifying, but it was also like, I, it, I don't know. It was, yeah, it was like she just got caught in the storm and I felt bad for her, you know, but yeah. Oh man, oh, that poor girl. It, <laughs> oh, terrible. Lovely gay, that's the line I, I, I love from the story. <laughs> oh man. Oh, thank you, Rob. So, uh, Rob, what do you want to plug? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, thank you guys for plugging the Magnet Theater. It's a very special place for me. And my team, Sexy Baby, that is the name, uh, <laughs> is uh, <laughs> we perform there um, on Wednesdays. And there are virtual Zoom shows. They're a lot of fun. We're there. Uh, and we're there every Wednesday. So check out twitch.tv slash themagnettheater.com. Make sure it's the, because there's another one. But themagnettheater.com. Um, check out my blog and yeah, uh, Rob Penty on Twitter, R Penty on Instagram. Check me out. I'm trying to do as many of these storytelling shows as possible. And thank you guys for having me. This was great. Yeah, All right. Thank you, Rob. We really appreciate it. All right. And that is it for our show this week. Thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, we'll be back next Thursday, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern with a, a whole new set of guests. And uh, we hope you'll come back and join us. Follow us here on Twitch, subscribe to us on YouTube, and we'll talk to you soon. Please, God, stay at home. Bye. <laughs>